Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Hellion uh, virtual book launch. Uh, for those of you who those of you who've not met me uh, before, this is I, I'm Andrew Bamford. I, I edit the uh, From Reason to Revolution series. That uh, uh, the book that we're uh, we're launching tonight is uh, is published. In that book, of course, is uh, is Terry Crowdy's study of French light infantry during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Um, we've got a we've got a big crowd in tonight already. I, I think there are, there are over ninety registered, and we've got fifty in already. So I'll, I'll waffle for a couple of minutes more in the hope that. Uh, oh, well, thank you for somebody just confirming they can hear me. That's always good. Uh, I'll waffle for a couple of minutes more, and hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get a few more joiners. Um, we've done a few of these now. I suspect the veterans are going to be sick of this little bit of patter. But just for somebody anybody that's not used the uh, the demio. Uh, platform before for, for events like this. It, it's it's entirely web based, as you will have found out. You didn't have to download anything to uh, to get on here. Uh, obviously, the downside of that is, is that it does entirely rely on your internet connection. So, if if you're having any uh, any issues uh, with connectivity uh, and, and not hearing and seeing properly, um, so the simplest thing to try is the old uh, the old IT crowd solution. Uh, Turn it off, turn it back on again. Come out of your browser and back in, uh, and use the same link that you joined by to get back into the session. Uh, that may help. If you've got multiple browsers installed, uh, you could try different browsers and see if you get a better result. It does seem a bit to prefer some to others on different uh, on different operating systems. If all else fails and you do lose part of the session, you will all automatically be sent a recording uh, of the entire evening. Um, and so you'll be uh, you'll be able to catch up after the fact uh, as an absolute uh, worst case scenario. Although you have to fast forward through the first ten minutes of uh, there being nobody on screen and the uh, and the opening chat. Uh, I've put up once and I'll put up again uh, on the chat uh, uh, a discount code. So if anybody hasn't already got a copy of the book uh, or has a copy of the book and wants to buy another copy of the book uh, for, for a friend or or. or or indeed for themselves, uh, you can do so with an offer that is valid on the Hellion website through until uh, midnight tomorrow GMT. Uh, so I'll share that code when I finish speaking and, and I'll pop it up again at the end of the session. It's up there once somewhere in the chat already. Um, the format for the evening then, um, I'll hand over in a moment to uh, to Terry, so he can uh, he can he can give you a talk about the uh, the book and the and the research that went into it. Uh, we'll follow that then with a with a Q and A session. Um, there isn't the function to to physically bring people on screen to ask their questions. So what what I would ask you to do is, is pop any questions that you have for Terry in the uh, in the chat box that people have been using to introduce themselves. Uh, the uh, the software gives me the ability to flag up any questions so that I can uh, I, I can group them together uh, and and read them out at, at the uh, at the end. Uh, the one thing I would ask because there, there's just me on the uh, on the Hellion end of things as uh, host and tech support. Um, if you have any questions uh, that occur to you during the presentation, do, do please ask them as they occur to you. Um, and I can flag them up and have them ready to be asked at the end. Obviously, if Terry's already covered that point, then, then I shall simply skip the question. Um, if you ask lots of questions at the end, I've got to juggle asking the ones that have already been written uh, uh, and, and juggle that with, with trying to spot the new questions being asked in the chat. So uh, get your questions in early uh, and um, it will make it easier for me. Uh, I've got somebody in the chat saying they're struggling to hear. Uh, I've previously been told everybody can hear me, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping it's all good. If somebody could confirm in there that they can still hear me, that'd be great. Yep. Yeah. Okay, grand. I think that may be a fault, unfortunately, with, with, with the person who asked the question, uh, which, which may be... Uh, uh, a case of trying in that case to uh, to come in and out of the uh, the browsers. Although I realize as I'm saying that, if they can't hear me, that's not especially helpful advice. Uh, right, anyway, I've waffled for long enough. We've got plenty of people in. Um, I uh, I will hand over there for a the moment to uh, to Terry, our speaker. I, I I don't think really in a in a in a virtual room full of Napoleonic experts and scholars that he needs very much introduction. He he is the man. On, on on the topic that he that he's written on, uh, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, of course, with his, his previous work on the uh, on the Neuvième Légère, 
uh, and I've seen at least one, uh, one, one, one vive to that regiment in the chat already. Uh, so uh, I will, uh, I will disappear in a moment. Terry is uh, in the process of joining us on the screen, and uh, there he is. And uh, I will disappear. And uh, over to you, Terry. Hello. Just a quick sound check then, and make sure everybody can hear me. Yep, good. Right, thanks. I'm just waiting for that cue. So, um, hello, I'm Terry Crowdy. Uh, thanks for tuning in this evening. I'm coming to you live from my home in the Midway Towns in Kent. Uh, just a word of caution, I do live on a busy main road. It's the old Roman Watling Street. Uh, if you hear police sirens, don't worry. It's unlikely that they're coming from me. Um, and if the telephone rings, it's my parents because I told them not to call between seven and eight, our time. So those few bits of cautions in the way, let's push on. So before I start really, um, thanks to Andrew and for Helion for setting up this session at, and for publishing my new book. Um, I really wanted to uh, contribute something to Helion's from Reason to Revolution series. And although this book's firmly aimed at um, students of the Napoleonic War, it actually encompasses much of the 18th century on the way through uh, because a wise man once told me, if you really want to understand Napoleon's army, you have to know what existed before it. Yet much of what Napoleon did was rooted in the armies of the Ancien Regime. He and Berthier, the, bra the, the brains behind the Grand Armée, yet they were both products of the King's Army. You know, we should never forget that. So, so let me click over to the slides. So back to the book. Um, I suppose... <laughs> We should start with really what were my key research objectives writing this book? Um, you know, what things did I ask myself at the beginning of the project? Now, many of you will know I wrote a, a history of the French 9th Light Infantry um, Regiment, uh, the 9e Leger, called Incomparable. It's a fantastic project focusing on a single regiment through the Napoleonic Wars. And, yeah, but when I did the research for that book, I obviously studied the subject more broadly, um, particularly the phase bet between the Seven Years' War, uh, so it's the uh, French Indian War, all the way through to the revolution. And I didn't really have much space in, in Incomparable to deal with that subject. And yeah, I've realized writing this book that I would describe myself as a bit of a student of irregular warfare. I do like light infantry, special operations, all the way through to military espionage, deception, all of those sorts of things. So I enjoyed coming back to this subject. Now, it's an interesting thing really, but lots of times, and you may have heard this yourselves, you know, I often read that Napoleon's light infantry were no different from the line infantry. They had the same armament, they had the same equipment, they had the same drill. The only apparent difference was you know a slightly different cut of uniform and you know lots of people perpetuate this and although there are some truths in this statement and under napoleon particularly post 1808 you know the the unique role of light infantry did diminish but if there was no difference between line and light why did france increase the number of light infantry battalions from 12 battalions in 1791 up to 185 battalions by 1812. Uh, why did Napoleon introduce light companies in every infantry battalion? And, and why did he even recognize the difference between line and light in his Imperial Guard with regiments of grenadiers, regiments of chasseurs? He had ample opportunity to reform the infantry, particularly in 1808, if he wanted to create a single species of infantryman. So, what was the difference between them? And I think this is the key question for me. I think I've just mentioned the voltigeurs already. And it's always puzzled me. Why did Napoleon want to form light companies within his light infantry battalions? Why not simply have more chasseurs? What was Napoleon trying to achieve with this uh, innovation of his? And another thing that puzzled me was why the French never formed the specialist rifle corps. We know about the, you know, the British 95th Rifles, thanks to Mr. Cornwell's Sharp series. But why 
didn't the French have a similar regiment to that? I suppose another big question is how did the French skirmish? So, you know, how did they do it? How did they deploy? How did they fight? There's absolutely nothing about skirmishing in the infantry regulations, the 1st of August, 1791. And that document is the basis of infantry training throughout the period. How did they do it? How did light infantry deploy in skirmish formation and so on? Well, I'm not going to have time to answer all these questions in detail this evening. And after all, I actually want you all to go out and buy my book. But I'm going to highlight just a couple of these key themes to hopefully whet your appetites. So let's start somewhere here. So we've got, you should be able to see this lovely uh, new picture by uh, Patrice Corsell, which I, I'm going to describe and which obviously is it within the book. So Napoleon's light infantry regiments ultimately originate from a small number of irregular free corps that existed in the mid 18th century. So before you know anything about light infantry regiments, you have to know about partisans. Now, forget the modern interpretation of the word. Um, you know, in French, the word partisan, it originates from the same word as party. So it's perhaps to a better, um, it's better to think of them as a sort of a party de guerre, or I suppose in, in English, we might say a war band. That sounds a very sort of 18th century term. So these are irregulars who conduct uh, the petty guerre, which is you know, the French word for guerrilla, you know, Spanish guerrilla or petty war, little war. So it's, a, it's the war of outposts and it's the attack on enemy's lines of communication. And these irregular corps tend only to be formed during wartime. They can earn prize money. And it actually helps if you think of them as a kind of um, like a privateer or a corsair using the French word, you know, like a land corsair not pirates because they were legitimate combatants, but they fought away from the regular army. Now, something I didn't know before um, starting this project, and I think it illustrates my point well, is in 1814 and 1815, Napoleon authorized the raising of partisan bands in France. And um, perhaps these were, I don't know, perhaps these were the first French resistance. Uh, you know, you have the, Front tireurs in the uh, you know Franco-Prussian War, and actually, if you think of the communist resistance in France in the in the Second World War, you have the uh, Front tireur and Partisan. That word Partisan comes back again, doesn't it? So perhaps these were the the forerunner of that, and anyone could form one of these Partisan bands. You just needed enough men. You needed the permission of your local commanding general. And in return for this, for setting these units up, you receive the patent. So it's a letter confirming you were not a brigand. So if you were caught, you weren't going to be hanged. Um, and so here, what I've done is I asked Patrice Corsell to make an interpretation of a, you know, an old Napoleonic veteran, a veteran of the consular period, perhaps at Marengo. And you know, faced with the threat of invasion, he rounds up his local villagers, the woodsmen, you know, these people that know the countryside and they said, right, let's band together. We're going to attack these allied invaders. And the men fought for prize money. And there was some impressive um, sums that, that were paid as by way of a bounty. So if you could capture messengers, if you could capture officers, that there was almost like a menu. There was like a, a list of what you, you know, how much money you would get for capturing each person. Uh, if you could get your hands on a general, I mean, you were going to be seriously rich for this. So it's a it's a really interesting thing. So this this spirit of the irregular warfare carries right through into the Napoleonic time. And I think there's a whole subplot to the campaigns in France in 1814 and in Belgium, yeah, you know, with the Army du Nord in 1815 that I think in certainly in the English language needs to be more, there needs to be more work on this. I think it's a, you know, a really interesting little subtopic. So moving away from the partisans then. Um, so we've got on one hand, we've got these formal light infantry regiments. Uh, they, they come out of the irregulars, uh, they become legions. These become battalions of chasseurs. Under the revolution, these become the half brigades of light infantry. And then finally, for the first time, they actually become proper regiments under Napoleon. Um, so that's 
one type of light infantry. The other type of light infantry are the light companies attached to every battalion. And so Napoleon called these the voltigeurs. Um, it's interesting, another thing I didn't know, he did actually toy with the idea of calling them partisan companies. And for me, that actually would have been a, a more precise definition. You know, they were supposed to be these kind of raiding type troops that, that would go off in the advance guard. But alas, we ended up with voltigeurs, more of which in a minute. But what's important is there is nothing new in the idea of putting light companies in infantry battalions. This is not a Napoleonic innovation. If you go back to 1759, the French create chasseur units out of the best marksmen in their battalions. And so they, have, yeah, they create a chasseur companies. These companies amalgamate and unlike the irregulars out there burning and looting and you know, pillaging and all of those sorts of things that they were doing, these light companies are intended to provide line infantry with close support in terms of being scouts and skirmishers. Now, disastrously, in my opinion, the French suppressed all light companies in 1791. So a year and a bit just before the war, they turned around and just said, that's it, abolish all the chasseur companies. We don't need them. And the reason for this, it, you know, it's a, I go into it in detail in the book, but there's some Prussian loving theoretician who says, all soldiers can skirmish. We have no need of chasseurs, get rid of them. So the French can actually be quite pragmatic when it comes to ignoring illogical regulations. Of course, they needed chasseur, you know, and light companies, but these things are come out of necessity. So through the 1790s, particularly in Italy, the French recreate their own light companies and they call them éclaireurs. And I, I was surprised when you actually start delving into this, that this is quite a common thing. Even going out to Egypt, you hear about the, you know, the éclaireurs or the scouts. So with the voltigeurs then, Napoleon, he's really only formalizing something that's already going on. His innovation, and if you could call it that, was to restrict entry to the voltigeurs, not based on marksmanship or agility, but on the men's height. And as you'll famously know, voltigeurs are short. So you have this odd situation that men who were previously considered too short for military service are now rounded up, drafted in, processed, given uniforms, and absurdly, they are classed as elite troops. Um, it, you know, it's absolutely stunning, really. Um, and the other thing that absolutely puzzles me is Napoleon gives these light companies to the light infantry regiments first. So the voltigeurs are formed in light infantry in 1804 and then in the line infantry a year later. Why? Why did the light infantry need light companies? They were all light companies. It, it does start to confuse you the more you look at this. And look at the name, the word voltigeur. It's actually a form of equestrian circus acrobatics. Yeah, it's it's a people who could leap onto a horse. So did these um, diminutive heroes ever actually leap onto the backs of horsemen and ride into action? Um, I've, I've seen a couple of potential examples of this, but perhaps more convincing is um, old Marbo, uh, the celebrated Marbo. He effectively assassinates this idea of, of voltigeurs riding. He thought the idea was absurd. You know, it's best left to acrobats who've been training to leap on horses from early childhood. This isn't something you could get your average peasant from the Vosges and say, hey, in two weeks, we want you leaping up and down off of horses. He actually thought it was absurd to suggest light infantry could even run alongside cavalry in support of them. He said if the weather's wet, the horse's hooves turn the field into a quagmire. And men can't even march through this, let alone run. And in summer, the horse's hooves would churn up a great cloud of dust and straw and rubbish. And anyone trying to run alongside these horses would just be choked to death. So, you know, I think these are valid interpretations here of, of, of the situation. Uh, more practically, Marbo pointed out it was impossible for a voltigeur to climb onto the back of the horse if the rider has his portmantle behind the saddle. So you all would have seen this in illustrations and war games figures. It's that sort of roll behind the saddle. 
So if that's there, you can't put the voltageur there. And you can't put the port mantle to the front of the saddle because on campaign, apparently, according to Marbo, the riders keep their forage for their horses to the front of the saddle. So there's simply no room for these people. So let's take that with a pinch of salt. So that's one thing I explore in a lot of detail. The other one is rifles. So let's talk a bit about rifles. So we don't see this kind of equivalent of the, you know, the 95th rifles in the, in the French regiment, just to name one. We know that the British, the Austrians and so on, various German states, we know that they use rifles to good effect. So what about the French? Well, I've been studying the French army for a fairly long time now. Um, you have to understand this concept of Elan, you know, this offensive spirit, this cult of the bayonet. You know, this is the same nation that attacked German machine guns in 1914, dressed in red trousers with officers with white gloves and plumes. Okay, you've got to think of this mentality, this warrior mentality. Now, when the war began in 1792, the French actually had very, very few light infantry at all. Um, they had 14 battalions of chasseurs, the majority of which were posted around the country watching various mountains and borders and so on. So if you actually look at how many are in the theatre of war, a handful, maybe one per army. And actually, if you look at those battalions of chasseurs, the majority of the officers are just up sticks and left particularly on the declaration of war. A lot of the noble officers just said, we're not having anything to do with this. And so you've got these battalions, very small battalions, um, no officers, you've got sergeants and so on quickly trying to, you know, learn to be an officer and everything. They're not in a great shape. And so they blunder into the Austrian troops and they find themselves getting shot to pieces by rifle armed uh, light infantry. You know, the poor French can't even see their enemy. So we see um, the government frantically ordering the manufacture of rifles. They need rifles. They need to raise loads of light troops. They need rifles. They've got to beat the Austrians at their own game. So what happened to all these rifles? Well, just step back for a moment. So before the war, the French had experimented with specialist marksmen that they called carabiniers. And so in each of the chasseur battalions, you'd have up to a dozen of these people. It's debatable how many of them actually carried rifled carbines, if any at all. But, you know, they, they've made a, an attempt to, you know, identify marksmen. But then reforms of 1791 again, they get rid of the carabineers. There's no marksmen officially in the French light infantry battalions anymore. Again, you know, it's all infantry are the same. So eventually the rifles start arriving at the front and they start being given to the light infantry. Now this is unbelievable. This is fantastic. You know, you have to understand the French um, mentality at the time. They didn't like rifles because they couldn't get a reliable bayonet fitting. Yeah. So by having a rifle, they couldn't fight with bayonets. So they're completely missing the point here that the idea of the rifle is that you can fight from distance. No, nope, they're not having it. They want bayonets. So the riflemen ask for their muskets back. And I suppose by the end of 1792 or so, it, these things are just gone. They're, they're not interested in them. And yeah, the, this concept of engaging the enemy from a distance, it just does not compute. The French prize speed and manoeuvre and weight of fire and rifles give neither of these things so yeah they were dismissed there's a, a later study I, I think it's in 1814 where I think they actually dismiss rifles as the weapons of assassins you know okay good good in siege warfare and good for assassins but not for you know brave soldiers it's not the weapon for them now all that said Napoleon reintroduces rifles for his voltageur companies so the NCOs and officers carry them, not the soldiers. They're still equipped with a, a shortened version of the Dragoon musket, but the officers and NCOs are all carrying rifled carbines. And actually war gamers in particular might consider this in small scale skirmish games. So if you think every company of voltageurs has eight rifles, 
And although they're issued to the officer and the NCOs, that doesn't mean that the officer couldn't give his rifle carbine to a, you know, a particular hotshot in the uh, company and say, hey, you go and use this. And the other thing is, is that voltageur companies are often amalgamated into special battalions. So in a division, you might have, I don't know, you might have eight companies of voltageurs. So that's 64 rifles. And it also appears that some light infantry officers are carrying carbines for close protection. So the point I want to make here about rifles is if some Spanish partisan is shooting at a column from up in the rocks, the French can shoot back, but they prefer bayonets. So when we talk about the difference between line and line, what, what do we actually mean here? So what is the crucial difference between light infantry and line infantry? So I believe it's mentality. So you have to understand the mentality of line troops, bless them. Okay, let's deal with them first. So the Napoleonic battalion, so a line battalion, is like an ancient phalanx, isn't it? It's this fortress under fire, you know, being charged by cavalry and withstanding it. It's the mass, it's the, what was it at Marengo? You know, the redoubt of granite, you know, the solid lump of rock. Okay, so this is their mentality. Um, immobility is everything. Line troops are proud of their ability to withstand shock. You know, in the old days before the revolution, men would be lined up for three hours every morning just to rehearse this most demanding of maneuvers, immobility, just stand there and take it. Now, you take a few of these fellows out of that mass and they feel exposed. They don't like being on their own without the reassuring sh shouts of their sergeants behind them. On the other hand, light infantry are trained and encouraged to fight independently. So when being pummeled by artillery, light infantry men want to disperse, not to run away. They want to disperse and they want to go after the artillery and they want to kill the gunners. And when light infantry are charged, they run. But as soon as they get to safety, they reform and then they start shooting again. So it's this constant thing. It's a, it's a fighting through motion. It's really, really important. You have to have a completely different mindset for this. And so I think yeah, the informed commentators that I, I use in the book to discuss this from the time, they saw really that you can only train soldiers for one mindset or the other, not both. Yes, line troops can skirmish. Do you know what? Heavy cavalry can skirmish. They had guns too, but are they any good at it? Hmm, probably not. So as I say, it's, it is this thing of mentality and it's, it's that spirit of the partisan. It's still there. Now, the critical thing, I suppose, critical thing in all of this, how did the French actually skirmish? So this was, I suppose, the key thing for me really, how did they do it? Now, to understand it, as I've said at the beginning, you have to go back. So if we go back to the regulation of the 20th of March, 1764, I'm sure you all know it, go on Gallica or one of these sites, you, you can get a copy. Uh, and even less well known than that is the provisional regulation for exercising light troops the 1st of May 1769. Go back to these regulations. Now they talk about deploying skirmishers by beating the drum call La Breloque. Now La Breloque was, I've heard this described as a, a drum pattern that sounds like a drunken man falling over, but it, it's the signal for sending out working parties. So when the Breloque goes, uh, to the skirmishers, it is that signal, go to work. You know, that's effectively what it's saying. And these early regulations talk about dispersing the men with the command a la pale, which means to the straw. And so it's the instruction to break ranks, go gather forage. It's also the instruction given when calling a toilet break, apparently. So in essence, you're just telling the men, break ranks, go off, disperse. So put this into a skirmishing context. Once dispersed by the Breloch, the men run. They split up, they find cover, they find targets, they fire on the enemy. When you want to get them back, you sound a rally. It's simple. The only training a chasseur needs is how to load and fire his musket and how to run. 
Okay, so that's where we are. That's the going into the uh, war, the French Revolution. That is how proper train chasseurs fight. Complete independence. No words of command other than deploy, rally. Simple. Now, in the book, I talk about the instructions of General Scherer in uh, 1793. Now, I like Scherer. He sets up Napoleon's espionage networks in Italy and stuff, and I, he's quite a fascinating figure. So he has a slightly different approach to skirmishing. For him, skirmishers are a screen for the line infantry following in column behind it. So he takes three battalions of, line, of light infantry. He forms them into two ranks. So the 1791 regs tell you how to do that. He then has them open their files by two or three paces. So in effect, the light infantry are now fighting in line, but in an extended order to cover the whole frontage of the division behind. So by removing that third rank and opening the files, what he's done here is he's massively reduced the effect of enemy fire on this formation. But actually, if you think about it, it is, it's still a formation that we're talking about now. The earlier instructions describe men operating completely independently. But here, by having this kind of formalized skirmishing in two ranks, you now introduce the concept of skirmishers fighting as pairs. And later instructions reinforce the importance of one soldier being loaded at all times, covering his buddy as he reloads. And then by the time you get to the invasion of Rus Russia in 1812, we've got examples now of instructions for voltigeurs. And this changes again. So by now they're saying two thirds of the men disperse into a chain formed of two ranks with intervals of anything up to 15 paces between each file. But one third of the men remain in reserve and they, they, they act as a, a rallying point for the chain. And also that you can send reserves out and replace casualties or guys with broken guns or low ammunition and stuff like that. So it becomes much more sophisticated again. Now, a commander, he can advance, he can retire his chain, he can order it to open fire, he can get it to move to a flank. And the signals for this are given by the cornets or by drummers. The cornets, so this is the, you know, the French hunting horn. They, they appear to have been pretty ineffective in the din of battle. And so sometimes you see mentions here of NCOs having to go along the line with verbal orders and, and stuff like this. And one thing to note, and I'd love to hear examples of, um, you know, where this where this comes from. It's I can't find any reference for French troops using whistles in skirmishing context. They had uh, Belgian volunteers early in the 1790s under French service. They used them, I believe. I've seen uh, mentions of the Swiss using them later on, but I can't find a single piece of evidence there for French using whistles. So just looking at the time there, look, yeah, there's, there's a lot in this book. We've got, what's that, 198 pages, lavishly illustrated, beautiful color artwork, original artwork, flag art, it's all there. I think what I would just say is in, in my conclusion that you know, there clearly is a, a massive difference, I think, between the the light infantry and, and line infantry there, there are a lot of people who try to create this kind of universal soldier uh, but it, it at the time it doesn't work you know th this reliance on the phalanx you know the the mass it, it's not conducive to running around and skirmishing so of course line infantry could skirmish of course you could deploy a battalion in on tira and so on light infantry have the i think the right mindset and i think at the time it's generally accepted that service in the light infantry is the most arduous and it's the riskiest um, but in some respects it's the most honorable because light infantry always engage the enemy first so at that i will um bid you all merry christmas and so on um and if Andrew is there, we can move on to some questions, and I hope I can answer them. Okay, thank you, Gary. That was uh, that was great. Uh, I've, I've got quite a few questions. I'm I'm going to I'm going to duck out of the main chat for a moment and go into the questions. Uh, I, I will do a last skim uh, in case anybody. One more now. I'm just I'm just catching. 
uh, Eric, you're good. You're in the uh, you're in the question box. Uh, and any more after that, I, I will come and uh, and try and do a final sweep. But uh, I'll just uh, I'll just go through these ones first. Just bear with me a moment because I'm I'm conscious that there are, there are, there are several cases where I can probably pull a couple of questions together on the same theme uh, sure. rather than as dip, dipping back and forth again. So just bear with me a moment because there were a couple pertaining at the beginning to the very early days. Um, so one of the um, if, if if this works right, the question should appear, but I, I, they won't you, you won't see them on the on the recording playback. So I'm going to read them out as well. Um, so we've got a question, first of all, uh, going back into the 18th century theory. Did you look at any of the 18th century writing on partisan war, uh, Jenny, Ewald or Emmerich? Yeah, so uh, Jenny, certainly. There's the um, the classic, um, you know, the partisan um, work, which is excellent. Um, it's Grand Maison, isn't it, as well? Um, is the, you know, his treatise on Petit Guerre. Um, so, yeah, you know, without listing all of them, obviously, you know, in the book there is a, a bibliography there. What I try to do is is to start this thing by looking at. I understand I've, I've seen mention there of Frederick the Great's instructions and so on, but I started looking at some of these guys that had commanded um, partisan irregular troops in the sort of 1750s into the Seven Years' War, because these are the books that people were reading in the sort of 1780s when these uh, chasseur battalions were first being set up so yeah absolutely uh, because there there is no other source material really. there's nothing original being written in the 1780s you have to go back to the seven years war to to understand what they're doing and how if I could follow on from that one, then uh, again, again looking at precedents, but but specifically on the issue of rifles, the, the question was: uh, uh, Could French interest in rifles in the 1780s be due to their experience in fighting in North America in the American War of Independence? Well, I did look at that, and I wondered to what degree the you know the French experience in the um, call it the, the rebellion in Britain's American colonies. Um, you know, what to what extent did that influence the French and I read some interesting stuff so you got uh, there's a bit a mention of Lafayette talking about he, he was really impressed with um, you know American riflemen but actually they looked at, at, at the American troops and just sort of said that they're, they're really a, a militia really and you had this sort of slightly snobbish attitude for them to be you know that these French guys are you know they're noble officers in regiments with long traditions they seem to actually be quite dismissive um there's one of the writers was a much more he looked at the um in the uh, wars in canada the uh, arcadians and he gave some examples of sort of french canadians shooting up uh, english um columns and said you know these these are a really really good um example to follow but in Europe, I don't know, it seems to be very much a, it follows a European context, so the French only really dabble in um, in light corps and, you know, regular units after they encounter those coming up from the Balkans in, in the sort of the Habsburg armies. And again, it's only really until 1792 when they, they run into um, light troops fighting with the Austrians that they again have this mad push to you know get loads of light infantry so much of the debate in france is actually we don't need chasseurs we don't need light infantry everyone can do it now we had we had some more questions about rifles actually so since, since we mentioned rifles there i'll just see if i can it is uh, I, I think it's a very fascinating subject with the French and rifles. Mm, there was one then here. Um, I believe there are others, but I'll, I'll, I'll pop this one up while I see it. Uh, uh, simply, uh, what was the rifle manufacturing industry like in France? Well, I'm I'm not an expert on on arms manufacturers. Um, so they had the, I think in the Napoleonic time, the the, the famous sort of you know uh, Versailles carbine seems to have been a bit of a luxury item. M my understanding is is it wasn't so much the manufacturer of rifles one of the things they had more trouble with i think was getting good quality gunpowder 
with these things. And I think that made perhaps made rifles slightly more unreliable. Um, but as I say, it's um, in 1792, they're actually buying the rifles from Liège. So that's, you know, Belgium, isn't it? So um, this isn't something they're, they're mass producing themselves. It is something that they have to go out to source. Um, and, but as I say, I think there's, there is a general rejection at, at various times by the French of the rifle. On, on that very topic, then, rather neatly, um, uh, I, I, th I think Dave is setting you an exam question rather than a, a, the conventional source here. He says, I see a disconnect between the denial of rifles use and the overriding hypothesis of Leger tactics. Discuss. <laughs> well, let's have a little think about this one then. Um, so one of the things I talk about in the book is one of the classic um, tactical innovations of the 1790s is this tireurs on grand bands. You know, it's, it's just masses of skirmishers. And it's, as I said, it, the French are really into speed of maneuver. So it's you're throwing hundreds, perhaps thousands of skirmishers working their way quickly onto the flanks of the enemy to pull their line apart before you then charge it and, and attempt to break it. So the rifle is, it's just, they don't get it. They don't get the idea that you can stand from a, a distance and take pot shots at people. They, they actually want to get in there. They want to occupy the ground that the enemy's standing in. It's a very offensive spirit. And, it, it, you know, you'll read about Duhem, um, you know, General Duhem, and he was a, a captain of one of these um, sort of free companies in the early 1790s. And he, he talks about his carabiniers that they gave rifles to. He said, effectively, we disarmed them by giving them these weapons. They just couldn't use it. The other thing he did actually mention is that the, um, and this may be answering the previous question, um so he said one of the problems they had was with the ammunition not just the powder but the actual ammunition that after a day's fighting these carabineers would have to sit there all night making fresh ball because the um the rifling pretty much every single gun he was saying needed its own mold that you know there was that it wasn't very standardized and so he just said the whole thing with rifles they just couldn't get on with it and the worst thing of course is you can't attach a bayonet to these early rifles uh, and that that just finishes them so as i say it's it is a mentality thing because we're so used to this idea aren't we of the of the sniper of picking people off but the word sniper doesn't come around until the 1820s i believe it's 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 not a known term then so as i say it's it's tricky have a look in the book i talk about it they just cannot get their head round rifles and skirmishing. Thank you. I think that's actually answered a couple of other questions as well. So to, to, forgive me if, I, if, if you've asked something very similar and I, and I don't read it out because I'm conscious we're, 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 we've got uh, uh, a, a slight time issue. I want to get through the rest of them. Um, moving on to something a little bit different then. Um, a question here from Paul who asks, uh, extent was the skirmish screen used to conceal the troops behind? Did it rely on black powder smoke as well as the physical presence of the light infantry themselves? So this, this is a really good question and I think if you think of this concept that Scherer introduces, so it's this chain in front, it, it in effect it is a smoke screen because yes you do have the you know the powder, um, you know the, the smoke coming off the black powder and so on, I think if the skirmishers had been static, that powder would, would have built up more. But it, it's a distraction, isn't it? You've got these guys coming at you. It's a massive line. It's open order. You can't ignore it. You've got to deal with it. Um, and if if you don't have your own light infantry to go off and to you know counter these people, you're going to get into trouble. So the whole point of it, I think, is is to distract, uh, yeah, to distract the enemy from seeing what's coming behind the skirmishers. Now, it's quite interesting. It, somewhere in the book, I talk about Wellington and, and wondered if he'd read some of these French texts 
because it says the way you deal with this is if you if you sit your troops up on a hill you can actually look over the top of the skirmishers and you can see what is coming behind them um and you know it, they basically give the key of how you negate this but um but it is um I, I think it, you know it is just it's this wave of fast moving troops that you've got to deal with and it's screening what is coming in behind you thank you you've again given me a brilliant link into the next one here um because the, the question uh to what extent did the british light infantry and the french light infantry influence each other's tactics uh during the period and, and i'll ask well, i won't put it up because it's uh, it's the next one down i can see it here uh, but I think a link thing to answer at the same time, uh, a question from Stephen who says, uh, how did the French like to do so well against other nations, uh, but not the Brits? Well, I think it's, some of this is a question of when. So at the beginning of the war, the French did terribly. They were shot to pieces by enemy light troops and, and their actual way of dealing with it was just getting thousands and thousands of light troops and just throwing them at the enemy and overwhelming them but this question here so th there's a really influential work um by um what's his name uh, jarry and he writes um he's a french emigre who actually starts off in um he has quite a, an interesting little career he ends up going over to to england and then training officers and they they apparently they didn't quite like they thought this sort of gangly french character was was a bit of an oddity but he wrote the most brilliant um treatise on french light infantry and it was around the time of the invasion scare so sort of 1803 1804 and the in the foreword to this book he says he said if the french come over the channel we're going to have to deal with their light troops and and this is how they're going to fight and so this jarry gives this whole you know from the advanced guard work to battlefield skirmishing to everything it's fantastic i, I do talk about him at length because he, he does give away the sort of trade secrets so if we look at that if we're looking at that kind of invasion scare um you know it, sort of late consular period it looks like the british don't really have the troops to match this or the tactics they're not used to just the sheer weight of battlefield skirmishes that the French are using. So um, in terms of are the French then influenced by the English? Um, I don't think so. You get this funny one with Marbo and he talks about, oh yeah, we, we kill all their officers so much that the, the Russian officers stop wearing uniforms, you know, so we wouldn't see them. And he said, and, and the enemy light troops, they never did that to us. They never made us suffer like that. So I, I think, yeah, we take Marvel with a pinch of salt there. But I don't think the French are in, I think they have this, this mentality of, of, you know, what they do is, is they, they do it well. What I see though is after 1808, and I think the French army after the sort of um, Friedland campaign, you know, these guys that have done Marengo and Austerlitz and Jena and so on, a lot of these guys are dead by now or crippled uh, or exhausted and i think the quality of french troops just declines after this um you know it, you could turn around to northern italy and say you are all now french that doesn't mean that they suddenly have this incredible loyalty to the french army you know they're pulling in recruits from everywhere and i think what suffers is you do get this deterioration even in the light infantry or well, particularly in the light infantry and battles become just battles of attrition where it's just throwing column after column of troops into into the fight and they lose some of this subtlety i think they had before so i i think perhaps if i was concluding i would say one of the failures of the french is that they didn't evolve in the way that some of the allied nations did that they yeah they saw what the french were doing with skirmishes and they said right we're going to match that and then perhaps even exceed that this one i suspect you, you may have already part answered but I, I, i'll put it in, in case there's anything else was uh, a question from dave he, he says when the french incorporated light infantry units from the regions they'd conquered and he mentions the uh, grenzers uh, dalmatians albanians and so forth 
uh, did that have any influence on, on doctrinal tactics? So I mentioned that I think the, um, there's a general recognition that Croats, as they were, were generally labelled, were brilliant at skirmishing. Yeah, they just said that's in their natural, well, their national characteristic, they're very good at it. Did it have any influence? Unlikely. You know, it's that there are no real, um, there is no real doctrine for, you know, developing light infantry tactics and stuff. It is, stuff is just being written by quite often sort of generals who are saying, look, we, you know, if you're coming into the army now, you know, and you're a young officer, you need to know how to do this stuff. Um, I don't think there's really any tactical development at all. Thank you. Sorry, I was hunting uh, some more questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to be a bit selective because I'm conscious we're supposed to be finishing at eight and we, we, we don't want to tax Terry uh, too greatly, but uh, there, are, uh, there are a few more good ones. I mean, an another one here actually uh, on a, again, a, a not entirely dissimilar theme. Um, did the French have some regional excellence in the light infantry, regional or district troop, uh, district troops like they had for later example with, with, with the Chasseau des Alpes? Right, so this, this is a really interesting thing. So this goes back, again, back into the Seven Years' War. Oh, no, what am I saying? This goes right back into the previous centuries where you have the, uh, you know, the Enfant Perdu and stuff like this. And the French have this notion that, that the best light infantry come from the mountains. They're little wiry men, you know, fast marchers, um, you know. And when they form the chasseur regiments in 1784 they use the you know regional names and then in 1788 when they create the chasseur battalions the independent light infantry battalions you know there's Cévennes and Ardennes they're all named after kind of mountainous regions a few of them yeah like the Corsican chasseurs raised in Corsica they're probably Corsican but I, I looked at this and I, I do give some statistics in the book from some of the um, inspection reports I did survey from 1788 um, and 1789. Most chasseurs came from either the Languedoc or from Alsace or Lorraine. So I think there was one of them, I can't remember which, which unit it is, um, you know, eight of them come from that region. Um, then when you look at the trades of these people, uh, they're all they're, they're either agricultural labourers or they they work in city professions. Um, the mountain men don't join the army. They're reclusive people that live up mountains. <laughs> Trying to stick them into a uniform and, and all of that, it, it isn't going to work. And so I think there's an element of romance in these titles. You know, they're attempted to make them portray as rugged things. I, I rerun the experiment, I think in 1805, and I look at where the recruitment depots are for the um, for all the, the Leger regiments at, at that time. There, there's no attempt at all to recruit mountain men. They, they just get them from wherever. Uh, as I say, there's an element of romance about this. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do three more to, to, to wrap it up, which I think will hopefully bring us on to things that uh, that we haven't uh, touched upon yet. So but please forgive me if, if if your question hasn't been asked. There's been uh, pretty much a deluge and there's a fair bit of debate I can see going on in, in the chat as well. Um, but as I say, three uh, that, that we haven't. So first of all, um, oh, I didn't see this was two. There might be thought because this was a two part question. I didn't see the second part because I put it up. Uh, the bit I was going to follow up. Uh, was there anything unique or special done in the light infantry training in the camp of Boulogne? Uh, and then the related question, uh, is there anything that the French decided other than rifles that they rejected for light infantry tactics versus other nations? Um, I think with the camp of Boulogne, I, I would have to go back to my incomparable uh, book. Uh, one of the great things that they did is because it, obviously they're rehearsing for the invasion of um you know england th there's one bit where they they're almost practicing um assault landings so they're putting the voltageurs into you know the napoleonic equivalent of landing craft 
And these guys are rehearsing, leaping out of the boats, running ashore through the surf, um, skirmishing, sort of forming up and charging off and, and uh, you know, clearing the beach. It is, it is very um, sort of Normandy 1944. I found, I found that quite an interesting little thing. Um, but typically, I think what's happening in the camp of Boulogne is that from what I've seen, there's an awful lot of emphasis on on the formal 1791 drill books. So we're looking at these evolutions of the line, the divisional manoeuvres and things like this. And I suppose, you know, to, to a large degree, the light infantry are standing there next to, um, you know, their line um, compatriots being marched around in formations which are, you know, of, debatable use to them you even get one of the classic things where Ney turns around and says you know because some pre-revolutionary um uniform regulation said all oh, all soldiers must have long white gaiters and he just said that's it i want all my men dressed in long white gaiters so you end up with you know the neuvième leger the colonel just going well when god's name am i going to get two thousand pairs of limb made um, and they being very upset that his men are not wearing white gaiters, as the regulations say. So, you know, I think in terms of light infantry training, um, not a lot. One little thing I would just add is I did see in uh, 1784 and 85, reading some of the inspection reports, um, you get little comments from the inspectors like this battalion shoots at the target very well. So in the old days, in the you know the old Royal Army chasseurs, these guys were learning to be marksmen. Um, you know they were spending time on the range shooting at things, which I don't think you know the later Napoleonic armies did in any great measure. Uh, that that you, you're doing brilliantly on the linked questions here. That uh, uh, brings me perfectly on to the, and I promise this is the uh, the second to the last. Uh, but how, uh, how significant were the differences in the ways in which particular regiments tended to employ or not employ uh, their, their light infantry companies? Um, that's a tricky one. And because I, I just don't think we actually have that source material. Um, you, you know, you would need to go down into sort of regimental daily orders almost uh, to see this. One thing I would say, though, is regiments tended not to employ their light infantry companies. So this is something I go into in a fair bit. One of the absurdities of creating the voltigeurs is now you've got these extra elite troops. Um, when the division forms up, they say, hey, let's get all the voltigeurs together and we've now got this big light infantry arm. And meanwhile, the light, light infantry regiment is sitting there acting as a line infantry regiment, perhaps. So what you do find is that it's not that the regiment employs um, or has tactics. It's, you know, a general of brigade or a general of division. They have their preference for how they're going to use light troops. And on the day of battle, and I do give examples of this, they will sit there and say, right, I want all my voltageurs, get the whole lot out uh, and even form them into um, along with all the grenadiers. And so you start creating these elite battalions. And the problem with that is you now have stripped the center companies of all their elite things. So they now need to start training men that they go off and um, do skirmishing to, to support the, the parent battalion. So it actually weakens the battalion anymore. So as I say, it's not a regimental thing. I think it's it, it is something, it's it's how the general wants to use his division. And as I say, there's loads of examples, and it is something uh, the wargaming community might want to play with, is when you're sitting there lining these things up, get all your voltageurs out, get all your grenadiers out, and you're creating battalions out of them, of, you know, um, really quite good uh, troops. Although do bear in mind, if you try to use voltigeurs, who are the shortest men in the army, with the shortest guns, if you use them as shock troops, and they used to, they used to try and do that, um, you, <laughs> it is a bit ridiculous really. Yeah, you're putting, it's not like you're putting great big burly grenadiers with, you know, full-size muskets into a, an attack against the city. 
you are putting the shortest guys in your army with little guns uh, and that should be reflected in any uh, outcomes okay final question uh, I, I hope you'll like this one because I, I know it's a topic that you, that you enjoyed adding to the book uh, and, and slightly provocatively uh, what do you say to the argument that the irregulars of 1814 were more talked about than real well there's a brilliant um, French language study please don't ask me to say who it is off the top of my head it's in the book um, th these guys did exist and you know they exist because you get the orders um, in first thing 1814 from the king disbanding them and saying stop <laughs> so it's as I say yeah these guys were formed they had um, you know, as I say, they had these sort of bounty lists of, of how much money they could make. And we have the instructions first from um, when the uh, Bourbons come back and them saying, that's it, disband these units. And then you have from 1815, you actually have the, um, you know, the Allied sort of occupation power, power saying, if you guys don't stop it, we're going to start taking reprisals um, and, and shooting you. So the evidence is that these guys were working. One of the really interesting things that, that I, I saw uh, just prior to Napoleon going into uh, Belgium in 1815, he actually starts activating the partisans in, uh, I think, the, in the Ardennes and um, in one other area. And he starts saying, infiltrate Belgium, start moving ahead, start causing trouble. So I don't know. I think these guys exist. Um, I, I really do think there's more work is needed on these people. It, yes, it's a small thing, but I think it helps us give a more uh, around the picture to it. Um, certainly, I would not have liked to have been a, an Austrian messenger, <laughs> you know, charging along with these guys hanging around um, because you know they were particularly recruited from sort of backwoodsmen, people that knew the areas very, very well. Um, so as I say, it, I think it's an area we need to do more work. And uh, I'm sure there are reenactors out there that can see incredible opportunities for outlandish costumes, weaponry of all manner, and quite interesting weekends in the woods. So uh, yeah, enjoy that one. No, thank you. I think you've yeah, with uh, with, with that and the and the, uh, the re reconstruction that, that Patrice created, I, I think there's, there's a lot to go on there. You've given the reenactors and the war gamers some uh, some useful material tonight. I I'll end it there. I think we've bombarded you with far more questions than you signed up for. So th thank you for your patience in, in answering all of those. Uh, apologies to those who asked asked, asked questions and uh, and I didn't get time to read them out. Um, my only answer, as I'm sure Terry would, would, would echo, is by the book. Uh, I think you'll hopefully find it uh, it covered in there. I, I, I've put the code up again uh, for those who, uh, who, uh, who who would like to uh, to, to purchase a copy. Um, thank you again. I, I'm going to switch us off in a minute, Terry, uh, and then I'll, le I'll leave the chat for a couple of minutes just as the discussion there is winding down. Uh, and, and then I'll close things down in, in a few minutes when, uh, when people start leaving. So... Uh, Thank you again and, uh, and good night. Yep, thanks very much. Merry Christmas all.